Welcome to the Cost of Property Podcast, the podcast that turns your dreams of owning a piece of paradise on the Costa del Sol into reality. I'm Warner Laurie, and I'm joined by my co-host and wife, Sandra Laurie. Join us as we embark on navigating the ins and outs of real estate and relocation to this beautiful region. We're not just about market trends, we're about sharing real life experiences, because we know the struggle firsthand, and I've helped many people navigate this challenge also. If you're dreaming of your perfect Costa del Sol home and want to get real, no frills, expert advice, then you're absolutely in the right place. Join us each week as we share honest insights and information that will guide your journey. Welcome to the Costa Property Podcast, another amazing episode of the podcast today. How are you, Sandra? I'm shell-shocked. You know, this is the third take of Warner trying to introduce himself. Anyway, but I'm good, Warner. How are you? I'm fantastic. Another beautiful day in the Costa del Sol. Every day is a beautiful day on the Costa del Sol, right? Amazing. And who is our special guest today, Sandra? Yeah, I'm excited for today's episode. Today, we're going to be joined by the lovely Jamie Rose. Jamie will talk us through his incredibly brave decision to relocate to Spain solo, so on his own, in his mid-30s. And this is a really relevant topic because the typical picture that people assume is that people relocate in groups, as a couple, as a family. But, you know, It is often very relevant that people do make that decision to relocate alone. They want to follow their dreams. So Jamie will be talking us through his experience, his integration journey into Spain, how he adapted to life in Spain, adjusting to the culture and following his very personal and special dream of following his life in the sun. A very brave man, Sandra. Yeah, you know, it is. It's it's a great story. So I hope our listeners will enjoy So, Warner, what is today's Spanish word of the day? The Spanish word of the day is cultura. Okay, great. So, cultura is the Spanish word for culture. I guess it's quite relevant because we do dive into adjusting to the culture. Jamie, it's amazing to have you here with me today. Thank you for freeing up this slot in your afternoon to to talk to me about your journey to Spain, which has really been an inspiring one. But before we do that, Tell our listeners a little bit about you. Yeah, so I'm super excited. I agree. We read so much, don't we, about like people buying retirement homes and and things. But actually, there is there's a huge uh, a huge number of people who are moving younger and younger. So I think it'll be a really exciting conversation. I guess I, I kind of debated like where to start with this, and I thought I'll just go with honesty. So I moved to Spain not for particularly good reasons in the sense I wanted to restart over. And I wasn't sure whether to share that. And then I thought, well, actually, I bet that will resonate with a lot of people in the sense that that moment when you sort of wake up to your life in the UK and I just realised I wasn't very happy. And and that was really this the 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 start of this this journey that, you know, that started the whole Spanish dream, if you will, like moving to Spain. I'm very happy sort of sharing a, a very honest and, and real overview of how it's been. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's exactly why I wanted you here with me today on this episode, because you are incredibly transparent about your journey. You touched on there around that point in your life of wanting to start over. And I really feel that when it comes to moving to a new country, buying a piece of paradise in the sun, it's Mm. that sentiment of starting over and really trying to find that slice of the pig and kind of realizing that despite convention, there's there's something more out there for us. So from your own experience, right? You moved to Spain on your own, in your thirties, in the guy. You know, talk to me a little bit about that experience, about that time of your life. What triggered that move? Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? Because when when you're younger and you hear people say it gets harder when you're older, it's true. <laughs> I, you know, it, it was, it was, it felt, it did feel very, very different doing it in my kind of mid thirties rather than say doing it in, in my early twenties or something. So it, it cut a very long story short. I kind of had ended a job in the UK. My relationship had finished and a few things collectively together. I, I, I kind of describe it now as like the best thing that happened at the time. It wasn't, but I kind of woke up to the fact that I wasn't particularly happy. I always think of the film Groundhog Day where every day was the same and 
you know, and I remember like when I look back, it, you know, that very typical kind of robot life, but I just wasn't aware of it, you know, in the car to go to work at six, that commute to the office, the, you know, all the pressure that comes with that. And then I was, you know, living in Cambridge and it's not the cheapest city. So there was this constant need this constant desire to progress professionally for for the money. I, I always feel in the UK you don't necessarily get that chance to take a soft seat back because there is the need to pay for the car, pay, pay for the fuel, pay to heat, you know, all these things that we've got to do, you know, just kind of normal life pressures. And um, so when it all came crashing down a little bit, I had that moment to really decide, do I rebuild in, in Cambridge? Do I pick another city or do I do what I'd always wanted to do and go to go to Spain. The reason I picked Spain over other places was just because really offered me on the surface level what I wanted. It was a better cost of living. It had the beaches, the mountains, the outdoor space, but it also left me very well connected back to the UK. The flights were very easy. The flights were reasonably affordable. And so I kind of got the weather and the outdoor space and that cheaper lifestyle. But I also had, with one hour's time difference, it, it really didn't impact me being able to work remotely and those other things as well. So that's how Spain was picked rather than, say, somewhere else where I needed to really consider those things. Totally related on that in terms of we are very blessed in the sense that we are 13 kilometres from Malaga Airport, mm -hmm. International Airport. You know, for, for you, it's very easy to get back to the UK as it is for myself if I travel to Ireland. So, you know, mm. I don't think we can underestimate that connectivity to the rest of the world. It's not like we're in Australia, right, where we have right. to consider seasonal differences, time differences. I remember, you know, if we want to get home, the time it takes, but also the cost. So Spain just offers that convenience in abundance, but also gives you that life that we dream of. It's fun, right? It does. Yeah. And I think as well, because Malaga connects to, if you want to go to America, for example, mm -hmm. it's so easy to, to change in Porto or Madrid and then get to America. So really, not only that, but it's got great connections into the Middle East and stuff as well. You can go via Turkey. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one thing I loved. I mean, I haven't, I've been to America, but I haven't explored anywhere else. But it, that was a bit of an attraction for me, knowing that I could take the ferry into Africa or I could take a flight and go somewhere else. I haven't yet done that, but in theory, there, there's the connecting flights if you want to. And I, there's something I really love about that. It feels very connected to, to everywhere. So savory. Mm -hmm. Like we've touched on the great things, but let, let's speak frankly, you know, it's a huge life decision to pack mm. your backpacks and relocate to another country. I mean, your situation, relocating on your own. What typically would have been the concerns that would have ran through your mind at that point when you were relocating? What would you have been worried about? Isolation, because I didn't speak Spanish and I was moving alone you don't really have the ability to validate information that you find. And that was one thing that uh, as somebody who is, is, I'd like to know the information I have is correct. And when you go online, you're not really getting factual information. You're getting people's stories. And the issue with stories is that you can't validate the work they put in. So a prime example is when I was looking at how to do the paperwork, you know, some of the horror stories, but actually, I, for example, I didn't experience any problems in that, and I know other mm. people who experienced none. So th therefore, it begs the question of, were they just doing the paperwork incorrectly? So I found that really frustrating is that I couldn't actually validate because I didn't know anyone here that I could say, well, I trust that person or I trust that person. And I will say that what you read online as a whole, I find very misleading. Now, I've lived here for four and a half years. So I think that isolation is definitely a big one. How will I interact as a whole i think we must recognize is difficult isn't it whether we're changing jobs whether we're changing location as soon as we change our habits and behaviors and everything else it, it throws us into that kind of slight overwhelm and stuff and lastly i would say language as well the the spanish because andalusia is known for they speak quite quickly let's say it's a language in its own <laughs> in its own right so they, they sure. were the main concerns for me so three really valid concerns i was, i love your perspective on these so i'm going to go into each of them individually if that's mm. okay if we take you know the isolation piece which is is a really valid concern it ties in i think a little bit with the language piece but we'll, we'll dive into that one in a minute 
you know, for a guy in your thirties coming to Spain without the language, how did you overcome that? How did you overcome that isolation and make connections with people? I think it's, well, it, it depends whether you're introvert, extrovert. And that's one thing I had to take into account. Like when I first meet people, I'm more introverted. When I know them, I'm more extroverted. So it made sense for me initially to start out in co-working because it was a kind of professional environment. I was able to meet people and that worked incredibly well. In fact, I would say two of the people I've known for the longest in Spain, I met in in co-working, actually one of them I'm meeting today. So co-working has been a really, really good one. And what I enjoyed about meeting people through co-working was that I was able to quite quickly establish a routine in that I was able to wake up at a certain time, feel like I was going to the office. So the co-working for me was great because I was able to use that as stability around this routine that I had been used to. I think the other thing, I didn't do this in the beginning, so I'm sort of sharing this from lesson learned. <laughs> I feel like I came to the next one is through like the gym and sports and stuff like that. I never actually used to do anything, but now I do quite a lot. And that's been a really great way. I've, I've met lots of new people through, through that avenue. And I've realized I should have done that before because actually that community, that crowd are really very, very open to new people joining, be it CrossFit, the gym, whatever it is you want to do, paddle. So that's one I've learned the hard way and that I didn't do that in the early days, but I recommend it. Now I do do it because it's definitely not just Spanish people that do that. It's a whole mix of people. I do think there's other ways to meet people. For me, I don't really drink alcohol, for example. So mm -hmm. I haven't talked much about the bars and the clubs and stuff because I, I mean, I haven't met people that way. I'm not really sure you would yeah. meet people that way anyway for a long-term kind of friendships and relationships. So for me, the co-working, but also the, the clubs, the walking clubs, the gyms, the, you know, CrossFit, all of those sorts of things. I have another friend who is part of like a speaking club, for example, mm -hmm. and she's learned to do, it's got a name, hasn't it? I can't remember what you call clubs like that. Right. Like, Toastmasters. Toastmasters, Toastmasters. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she, yeah. So she does that. One week it's in Malaga, another week it's in Marbella. Uh, and she's met some really cool people. I mean, that's not really my thing, so I haven't done that. But I'm using CrossFit as an example. But I know there's other types of groups yeah. like the Toastmasters. So I think they're a really good way. Absolutely. And I think the co-working piece, particularly since after the pandemic, we've seen mm. the rise of the digital nomads, the co-working spaces here are good. And I totally reiterate the point you made there. Um, it's very important to establish your routine. So whether you do that through co-working, you integrate that sports lifestyle into your life, because one of the pitfalls I see over here quite a lot is people come over here, get very drawn in by the sun lifestyle, and they're unable to distinguish that this is now your real life to holiday life. So I, I like what you say there, and pay attention at the beginning to mm. really work on integrating that regular routine, because this is going to be your normal life, right? right. Yeah. And then it's funny you say that. I think it's so true. Like when I work with clients, like, oh, have you been to the beach today? And I'm like, no, you know, there, there is this essence that you go to the beach every day. I mean, I could if I wanted to, but I think it's, it's allowing yourself that bit of holiday time to settle in. And then it is moving into, for me, I didn't have, maybe I, I'm a bit strange with stuff like this, but for me, the move had to work. There, there wasn't this option to play at it and then run the risk of having to go home. I, so I suppose I was quite strict with myself, but I think anybody relocating, be it by themselves with a family, I, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I never look back and regret that. You know, I, I do see people come, not necessarily just English, but from all over, and it turns into like a big, long holiday. And then you see this franticness at the end around what are they going to do? And so, yeah, I, I think that's really good advice about embedding yourself quickly because once you're here you've got all the time in the world to take a holiday you talked then about language we might you yes. mentioned that a little bit earlier like what's your take on the language okay it's a different language people speak spanish how important is that i would say vital i also realized i wasted a huge amount of time using apps and different things like that Honestly, I know when you first look at like a private shoot, so I've done it all. I've done the apps before I came. I've done the, the language schools, all, all of it. And honestly, my Spanish never really progressed beyond um, an okay level. It wasn't until I started working with one-on-one -on -one tutor that it, it progressed in, in sort of two months. It progressed maybe what I'd learned in the other 
ways in in maybe six months. So what I would say is that I think language is vital. I know a lot of Spanish people do speak English, but I do also think that there comes a point, like, as, as you know, I have Spanish friends. In fact, I don't really know anybody that's from the UK. We have to remember that whilst they may speak English, it doesn't mean that they want to speak English. So mm -hmm. if they've had a really long day at work and you're meeting up for like a, you know, a drink after work and stuff. So I think if you want to truly integrate, which I think is, is essential, I think speaking the language is really important. And don't forget, there's a big difference between speaking the language for a professional reason versus speaking a language for friends. Mm -hmm. And the reason I reiterate that is because I got really hung up on that about being grammatically correct all the time. And actually you don't need to be, you can really have fun with it because I don't need it for work. I speak English for work, but actually just that socializing doesn't matter if you make mistakes or use the wrong port or para, you know, or it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you slightly use the wrong verb or something, it's, it's, it's okay. But I think the language is vital. I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but there is, there is a rumor that I hear that I'm not able to validate myself and it is that the easiest way to learn, to learn the language, in addition to all of your great advice, is to get a Spanish partner. What's your take on that? Well, I was in a relationship for four years and that was a headache. That was about it. I, I mean, I, I think you're better off paying for a teacher. You know, if anything, you kind of end up arguing over it because it's like I kept changing everything into English and then he'd come back and change everything into Spanish and then I'd change everything back into English. So, I mean, yeah, maybe it could it could help. But again, on a serious note, in relationships, you have to be able to speak Spanish because I found that, that whilst the person you're in a relationship with may be understanding, their family and friends most certainly mm -hmm. may not be. And in my case, for example, the person was from Cordoba. So the family were living in like a village just outside Cordoba. None of them spoke English. So again, going a level deeper, especially when we consider how important family is to the Spanish people, I think you've got to learn it. But I, honestly, I wasted so much time and money on these apps thinking, if I just keep saying I want a hamburger enough times, it will sink in. Like, And then you get a private tutor and you realize they're actually really cheap. And the face mm -hmm. value, they're more, they're more expensive. But what you learn in, in a, such a short amount of time, you really do progress much quicker. So I think if you can, I know it comes down to money, but I think if you can, to get a Spanish tutor, before you move, even if it was just three months before, just to give you that foundation that, because I, I think when I first landed, what's overwhelming is that you can't make sense of anything. Like, so you're sat in a coffee shop, but you don't understand anything that's going on. Whereas I think being able to land and understand basic conversation of what's happening around you enables you to feel a bit more in control. And I think when you feel a bit more in control, you feel a bit more rooted and a bit more calm and a bit more stable, maybe, if that's the yeah. right word. I think they're great points for consideration and, and really tangible advice. I, I mm. totally agree with you. Mm. Third consideration that you mentioned, the bureaucracy piece, right? And we, we all hear it, we hear the rumours about how bureaucratic processes are, how the difficult they are, manana, manana attitude. You, know, you, you mentioned that that really wasn't your experience in trying to navigate information and whether information is valid on the different Facebook groups or on online communities is, is really hard. I think I, I agree with you on that. And I've often heard it described as the like the wild, wild west. You know, you don't you don't really know what you're being told. But talk to us a little bit more about your experience with that and why I guess why was it easier do you feel for you? So one thing I've noticed is that that there's this mentality to say, well, in England, we do it like this, or in mm. Denmark, we do it like this. But, well, we're not in Denmark and we're not in England. So I think first thing, it's about having that mind shift in the fact that if we want to live here, we have to take the good with the bad. And in this mm. case, bad being that maybe they aren't as efficient as some of mm. the other countries. So I went into it on the basis that things may take longer and may take a bit more time. I think the thing that give people the biggest headache here, and I don't know why it is, but the town halls do operate differently. So Fuengarola, for example, might have one policy, Ben or Magna, another, Malaga, another. So again, when you're reading information online, someone could be writing that from Barcelona or from one of the other regions, and then it's not applicable here. So I, I think that 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 causes a lot of confusion. What I would say is that for me, when I was doing the paperwork, I always attempted to speak Spanish. I always attempted to be 
punctual and like thank them. And it's a bit like in Ireland or in the UK or wherever you are living, basic manners go a long, long way. There is this manana thing. There is because they are only open at certain times. We have to remember there is a plus to that. I know it's going off piece a little bit, but the, the plus to that in Spain is that you are doing all of this with a real person. So people often say, oh, I hate the fact you can't do this or do that. But actually, there is also a benefit that doing it in person means that you are actually able to validate that you've done it. You're able to, if you don't speak fluent Spanish, you are able to sit there and use your phone as a translator. So I yeah. actually prefer the fact that this manana approach, because it actually broke each section down a little bit for me. I, I think it's about being prepared. For example, we don't have ID in the UK here. We have the NIA that we have to get, and then you have to register with the town hall and stuff like that. So I think as long as you know what you have to do, it's not mm -hmm. particularly overwhelming. There are companies that will do it for you as well mm -hmm. for about a hundred euros. Mm -hmm. It's not expensive. So yeah, I, I found it fine, but I didn't go into it saying, I didn't go into it expecting it to be the same as the UK. I went into it yeah. saying, I don't know what it's going to be like. So let's start here and see how we get on. And maybe that's why it was less stressful for me. Mm. Um, I did also pay a company to check my paperwork for me. And it meant that I was going to my appointments knowing that the paperwork was correct. So I kind of had mm -hmm. that reassurance. Honestly, it cost me about 100 euros. I'm sure you probably mm. know people. And I would recommend doing that because there was something very reassuring about knowing that all of the paperwork was was correct. As far as like other matters go, I haven't really found a difference. Like I've been in Ben Omajna nearly the whole time and I've built relationships up with the people in the post office and the, I don't know, not necessarily the police station, but, you know, kind of the same as you would in any other country. And I find that, yeah, so I find the longer you're here, the more it changes. Like now when I want to upgrade my phone, for example, I know this isn't necessarily just bureaucracy, but these are internet and phones yeah. and bills. They're all things we have to deal with. It's it's just like in the UK now, you know, it's a walk past thing with the bank. Let's be honest, the banks are a pain in the butt here, aren't they? There's like fees for everything. But apart from that, it's, yeah, I really, I haven't, honestly, I really haven't had any issues. But like I say, I've never expected or had the attitude that, England does it this way because mm -hmm. it's not England. So you yeah. have to expect it to be different because, as you say, it is different. So there's a different way of doing yeah. it. But there is many, many companies and support or relocation consultants that somebody is nervous or they feel their Spanish isn't up to standard and hire, as you say, for very reasonable price to guide them through the process. But I also, when I'm asked about this, I always refer to it a little bit like Ryanair. Because okay, so everybody complains about Ryanair. Okay, and it's usually when you don't follow the rules, right? When your leverage is a little bit over or when you haven't followed your terms and conditions on their website. I think when it comes to Spanish bureaucracy, it's the same. You just need to be prepared. Things are definitely slower. But again, I suppose the question to ask really is that if, it, if, if that slowness didn't exist, quality, you know, the way people live would be different. Therefore, it'd be equal to the UK. Therefore, I wouldn't have moved. So, that, you know, when you sort of then relay it the opposite way, that 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 slight difference in culture and the way people are, it's the very reason why I moved anyway. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's when you think about it, logically, it's not a bad thing, you know. I want to ask your opinion a little bit now around, like, safety and security, because it's a brave, bold move. Was that ever a concern? Am I secure here? I've never had an issue. I mean, I honestly, if anything, I think it's, for, for me, I think it's safer than the UK because it's funny you asked that question because I was having this conversation not so long ago with a friend in the UK and I was saying that a certain time passes and it becomes very much drinking culture. It's like, it's, it's all about mm. the pubs and stuff like that. Here, especially through those long summer months, it's, it, you know, it's very normal that families eat out with grandma, with granddad, with the kids. So actually, even though it's sort of later in the evening, there's a whole variety of people out. It isn't just people drinking. So I would actually go the other way and say that actually it, it, it's it's safer at night time. I can't speak across the whole Costa del Sol or whatever, but I can only speak for Ben Omajna and Malaga, of course. But, you know, yeah, I, I love the variety of people out in any given evening because I think that for me, it feels safer when it's the streets are full of families and it's not, you know, I, I guess you've noticed as well, but it's not really tolerated to drink in the street here. You can drink in a bar, but you never really see drunk Spanish people. Not really. It's, no. it's not 
a tolerated thing, like it's not a normal thing. And I'm not saying that the UK does tolerate that, but what I am saying is I think here people have a lot more time to drink because the weather is good. There isn't that immediate rush to get drunk. And I think that changes the atmosphere at night time mm -hmm. as well. So I, I mm -hmm. prefer it. I, I also think as well, of course, it would be naive to say that it's not like anywhere, that I think part of that feeling, you know, I think sometimes our feeling of safety comes from when we also feel integrated, when we feel connected. Mm -hmm. So I think when we start at the co-working, we start seeing familiar faces, we start buying from the grocery store and people say hello. I, I think that feeling of safety and belonging also increases because we start feeling like we're actually part of the environment rather than it feeling kind of alien to us. I also think quite quickly, it's the thing that just grows and grows because you start recognizing the same people and that little basic interaction, a bit like what you're used to in your hometown or city. Mm. Yeah, fully agree. I want to pick your brain now, finally, on accommodation. There's a lot of horror stories, you know, online about accommodation, whether it's rental or purchasing, you know, that it's, it's a bit of a minefield to navigate. We know it's an unregulated market. How was that experience for you? Well, to be fair, it's been quite straightforward, but I have been very lucky. But I agree, it it is a minefield. And that's one of the reasons I haven't wanted to move out of my apartment, because mm. especially if you're renting in the first instance, it's especially this time of year, May, it's very hard to find anything because everybody just wants to rent for the summer. It is unregulated and I, I think it does serve as a problem if you don't know the estate agent. The, the, the biggest thing that I came up against last year when I was thinking about moving was that people seem to sort of invent the prices a little bit depending who you're going to. So a lot of people have the same property and they're actually sort of co-sharing that as in mm. they both get a cut from it. But there's not really sort of, they've put the price up a little bit to earn more and they sort of, I don't know, there are just some tactics that I don't like. I think that's what you do very well. And that's why I think that I would only go somewhere where I trust now. I think having experienced that like, it is important to be able, a bit like I was saying in the beginning, it's important to start building those relationships before you move. So then when you do land, you've already got a couple of faces that you trust and that you know the information you're getting is accurate because that's one of my biggest bugbears is when somebody does something that's a little bit underhand, for me, that trust is then gone. So like I was working with an estate agent, she told me one price, I actually had seen it at a different price and I confirmed it's a different price. As soon as that happened, my respect for her had kind of completely gone yeah. because I was like, well, if you're going to lie about that, what else is really happening? So, yeah, it is. I have to be honest, property, I think, is a bit of a minefield, especially when it comes to buying and you want to make sure everything's so It's a huge investment, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the biggest thing we buy. So, um, yeah, I will say that's probably one area that's a bit of a pain. But I don't think that is Spain per se. That's just a handful of naughty people because I think there's lots of people also doing it very well. Like, you, look how you do it. You don't fall into that category. So I think it's also fair to say that it's a handful of naughty people rather than a horrible experience because actually it's not a horrible experience. I think that's why it's really important to recognize straight on stuff. It is an unregulated market. So mm -hmm. as you rightly say, this is one of the areas where it's also important to do your due diligence, check mm -hmm. testimonials, check online references, even ask to be connected to previous clients, you know, to talk about the experience. I, I wouldn't be sure the bush with this one because it's it's important to get it right. For sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I looked before I came, that kind of service existed if you wanted to buy a three million pound house in Marbella. Mm. Like if you wanted that, there was very clear defined people who controlled that market and they were they would give you all the time and help that you wanted. But actually for everybody who's in that normal category where you've got X budget for your normal family home, it didn't exist. It was a minefield. Yeah. And that's what I think that you've done really well. It's kind of that security blanket that really people were only getting when they were buying the multi-million pound villas and stuff sure. that you've kind of created that network for people who are just buying normal family homes and normal family apartments or holiday homes, whatever it is they want. And that's what was, I think was really missing is that if you've got the money, there's absolutely that safety blanket. If you didn't, it was a bit of a free for all and who knew where you end up. And I think that's what you do very well. You've kind of put that safety blanket around normal people buying normal homes. And I love that. Thank you. It's important. It's important. Mm. Back to, to you, you know, you've managed to integrate very well, build yep. a lovely life in Spain, yep. and 
you know, you still operate a very successful business, servicing your clients around the world. Tell us a little bit about your business and what you do. Yeah, so originally when I moved, so this year will be my 16th year in recruitment. And when I originally moved, I was doing recruitment, but COVID came along and kind of nobody was hiring. So I kind of Mm. sat back and I was like, (laughs) what do I do? Like, and then I really realized after 16 years and I've worked at director level in the UK, I was like actually sort of mentoring and helping people online seemed to be the way I wanted to go. And I really wanted to do something that I could run online. I mean, because let's be honest, you have to weigh up what you want to do versus how you can do it. So I knew this kind of in-person stuff was ruled out, etc. So yeah, and it's just grown from there. And I think what's really, really cool is that uh, I actually have a lot of clients who are also living abroad and doing different things. But I also think that the quality of work I do maybe 10 years ago would have been compromised by me being abroad. Whereas mm. I've never had anybody say no to working with me because I don't live in the same country. I mean, my clients are dotted all over anyway, but I absolutely love it. I absolutely love that ability to build something online and to really help people. And I don't really know how to explain it in words. I just have this feeling that I wanted to stop bridging what felt like personal and what felt like work. I really wanted to work on stuff that felt more like a project and more than like living my best life. Does that make any sense? I'm not really sure how to explain Like, It just seemed crazy to sit there and say, oh, the week is for work and then the weekend is for living because one's five days, one's two days. That's not a balance. <laughs> that's not a balance I wanted. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's what Spain really enabled me to do. And I will be honest, when I moved, I didn't have loads of money. And Spain, it's a very undignified conversation, but it allowed me to take that time to build something because it was much more affordable to live. I wouldn't have had the same grace in Cambridge where my rent would have been four times the amount or something. So yeah, and I love it. Absolutely love it. I totally relate to that because, you know, when me and Warner came here in 2016, I resonate a lot with what you said. We came here for even money. But Spain gave us breathing space. Yeah. You know, childcare fees were cheaper, they were actually affordable. You know, yeah. you could go to the beach and go to the park and it didn't cost you, you know, you didn't need to re at your house. You know, everything felt lighter. It just gave that space that we really time to be able to, to build a life. And I think as well, it's funny because people always say, oh, we're moving for the sunshine, we're moving for the weather. Um, and we kind of laugh at that a little bit, don't we? Because so many of us say it. But the truth is that actually... I always said I'd move for sunshine. What I gained was actually hours because here I finish work and all the shops are open. The sun is still out. It's it's like I get a day to work and then I get a day to actually be social and do things. So actually there is truth behind this logic of moving for good weather. It's not actually as surface level as it sounds, but actually you get to do a full day. Because let's be honest, you've still got to work, haven't you? Like if you're going to move in your 30s or 40s, for most of us, we're still working. But actually Spain, because of its, its weather, gives us the ability to do that. I get to do a solid seven hours work like I did before, but I also get a solid seven hours to do everything yeah. else. And I find it just stops that stress bucket, you know, whereas in the UK, it's sort of, you add a bit more to your bucket and a bit more and a bit more and eventually it kind of overflows. I find just that downtime here, that relaxation and that fun time, just never, it just never boils. I'm not saying I don't have stressful days, I do. Um, but as, as a whole, you know, if I was to take it year on year, there's just something so lovely about having that downtime as well. I really value that. And, and that's not a Spanish bit, that's a weather thing, isn't it? So, yeah. Amazing. Damien, I really appreciate your insights and your time today. It's just been welcome. lovely to, obviously, I know, I know your story and your your respectful on things, but I just know it's going to be so valuable for our listeners. So thank you. But if somebody wants to reach you either, you know, from a professional capacity, from your business side, to talk about potentially how your services could support them or pick your brain on your amazing relocation journey, how would they find you? Where would they reach out? LinkedIn is the best place. That's my online home. What do you, what's your handle? How do they search for you? So Jamie, and then my surname is Rose, R-O-S-C. There's not many Jamie Roses. And it's all to do with recruitment or talent acquisition anyway. So I guess those looking for me. But of course, people are welcome to ask questions or I don't know if someone's buying a house and they want to ping a message to say, hey, what is it like working with Sandra? And, and stuff, you know, I can say, oh my gosh, yeah, don't do it, run. No, I'm joking. Um, you know, I can say, yeah, that there's different. So, uh, yeah, people are welcome to ping me a message and stuff. But I, that's what I really love about what you're doing. I think when you start building these connections and listening to these podcasts. I, I wish 
I, maybe stuff like this was around when when I was looking. I think maybe I was just foolish not to to find them. But also, I think that you don't realise how valuable they are until you've actually done the process. And it's not until you yeah. look back and you think, huh. I wish I would have done it differently. So if some people are listening to this thinking, oh, I'll do Spanish later. This is me really saying, no, start now. And then it's like, do I really need to reach out to them to buy a house if it's not going to be for a year? Yeah, really reach yeah. out now because it, it's amazing how when I look back, I really wish I'd put some feelers out on the ground level to make the process easier. I definitely could have done that. Thank you. I love that. Jamie, thank you so much You're for so your welcome. time and your wonderful advice. We'll put all of Jamie's contact details who is linked in Harbour to his website address in the show notes and right in case any of our listeners want to explore the services that you offer even further. Thank you so much for listening into today's episode on the Cost of Property podcast. Another fantastic episode learning about the highs and lows of relocating to the Costa del Sol from real people who have been through the journey themselves and of course our wonderful experts. If you have been enjoying the show so far, remember to hit subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating or review. We absolutely love hearing your thoughts. Please send any questions that you would like us to answer on the show to warner at wlcostaproperties.net or you can pop us a message on our socials, which are in the show notes. Remember, you can also visit the website, www.wlcostaproperties.net. See you on the next episode and bye for now. Bye-bye.